What is the spirit of Silent Hill? What are the essential elements that must be in every Silent Hill game? And what is okay to change? These are the type of questions I have been asking myself for the past several months as I revisited and analyzed several Silent Hill games. I went on this journey so that I and other Silent Hill fans could, ideally, give the developers of the new Silent Hill games a clearer idea of what we would like to see, in the hopes that the franchise wouldn't dig an even deeper grave for it to crawl out of like it did last time. Before going on this retrospective journey, the only thing I felt certain of, as do many other fans, was that the best games were the first three in the series, I mean the first four in the series, and the latter four were generally not as good. Now that my retrospective series is nearing an end, I feel I have a slightly better idea of what the spirit of Silent Hill is, but not as much as I had hoped. As I gave my opinions on the latter four Silent Hill games and contrasted them against the strengths of the first four, I received many earnest and constructive responses from people who disagreed with me. Reading people's praise of the latter four Silent Hill games really helped reinforce the notion that aside from comedy, horror is definitely the most subjective genre. It also made me develop a greater appreciation for what the developers of the latter four games were going through, the difficult creative decisions they had to make. I put myself in their position, and struggled to imagine a scenario where I would do any better. I figured that if I were in charge of a Silent Hill game, I would try to please every type of horror fan, and I held to that virtue as I worked through most of my retrospective series. But as I reached the end, I recalled a simple, familiar axiom that blew that virtue to bits. An axiom that I should have known all along. When you try to please everybody, you end up pleasing nobody. And I only recalled that axiom because I played Silent Hill Downpour. Now let me be clear, I'm just speaking about the general consensus regarding Silent Hill Downpour. I am not saying that there aren't people who genuinely love and appreciate Silent Hill Downpour and I celebrate that love. Moreover, I'm not saying that there aren't reasons to like the game. In fact, I think Downpour might have a greater sum of positive elements than the previous three games. It's got an interesting protagonist, an interesting story, solid graphics and sound design, some well-designed puzzles, and improvements in combat, at least from what Silent Hill Homecoming offered us. And this is just to name a few of the game's strengths. But the problem, for me, is that for every positive element, there's almost always a negative element that holds back the positive from reaching its peak expression. I will use a metaphor to explain what I mean. Imagine you're making a cake, and you're mixing a variety of really tasty ingredients into a bowl. Maybe some chocolate chunks, some raspberries, some custard. But instead of mixing all of those ingredients into a batter and putting it in the oven to bake, you are left picking the ingredients out with your bare hands, while trying to dust off the flour, the baking powder, and the uncooked egg. While some of those individual ingredients that you picked out taste lovely on their own, they didn't offer the cohesive experience you were looking for. That was my experience with the downpour. The entire time I played it, I could see the seeds of something truly brilliant, something that could maintain the spirit of Silent Hill while also crafting its own identity. But ultimately, the ingredients that were there often contradicted each other's strengths, because they did not gel like they could have, resulting in what was, for me, a disappointing experience. I will expand upon that cake metaphor as I go into the game's strengths and weaknesses, but before I do, I am happy to inform you that this video will contain no story spoilers beyond what happens in the first half hour. This means that if you have never played Downpour, you can watch this video safely. Finally, I am beyond pleased to tell you guys about this video sponsor. Question: When you think about a video game company that has top-notch art, music, game design, and a unique aesthetic that creates masterpieces with each new game, what is the number one company you think of? To people like myself, my wife, and perhaps many of you, we think of Vanillaware. And I'm very happy to be sponsored by Atlas West on this video for their new strategy RPG game, Unicorn Overlord, releasing on March 8th. 
Unicorn Overlord is the rebirth of retro fantasy strategy that harkens back to and pays homage to classic 16 and 32-bit tactical RPGs. It is a classic heroic fantasy tale, embellished with Vanillaware's signature beautiful aesthetic pleasing visuals and immersive music. In this nostalgia-infused game, you can forge alliances, liberate kingdoms, and explore an expansive world that bolsters an impressive 40 to 50 hours of gameplay. I know that many Tactics fans will have a lot of replay value by testing a variety of ways to complete a stage and enhancing their real-time strategy skills in this exciting epic tale. Some additional great news for those who want to try out the demo, your progress carries over into the main game on release. If you like the demo, make sure to pre-order it on your platform of choice, including Nintendo Switch, Xbox Series X and S, PS5, and PS4. Thanks again to Atlas West for sponsoring this video, and be sure to check out the demo by clicking the link in the description box below. In Silent Hill Downpour, you play as Murphy Pendleton, a man who was recently arrested and sent to prison for initially unclear reasons. One thing that becomes clear very quickly, though, is his murderous intent. He makes a deal with a corrupt prison guard to lock him inside a shower room with another prison inmate, who honestly looks like Philip Seymour Hoffman after surviving a freak meat grinder accident. Murphy then proceeds to murder the other inmate, which results in him being transferred to a maximum security prison. And in typical Silent Hill fashion, something supernatural occurs on the journey to the prison, causing the bus to crash and enabling Murphy to escape. On his journey out of the wilderness, he naturally finds himself in the town of Silent Hill, where Murphy must contend with the literal and figurative demons from his past. Fortunately for Downpour, it starts off very strong. It hooks you with not only the novelty of a criminal protagonist, or at least somebody we know is criminal at first, but also forcing you to murder somebody. This provided me with an immediate powerful injection of the type of discomfort that Silent Hill is best at, and thankfully, that feeling was sustained for a significant period afterward, due to the opening act's numerous strengths. Those strengths can be summarized in two ways. First, it sets up the mystery regarding why Murphy went to prison and why he wanted to kill the inmate in a very compelling way, one that kept me intrigued all the way up until the very end of the game. But what's even better is the way the game impressed me technically within the first hour. Let's start with graphics. For a game that was released around the end of the PS3 and Xbox 360's life cycle, it looks pretty good. Aside from a couple of technical issues like a bland texture here or there and some poor lighting effects, the art direction and graphical fidelity effectively capture the look of Silent Hill in its decrepit and fog-covered state. The same is true for the other world sections of the game, in all of their nonsensical, twisted, and bloody horror. Though, I should be clear, looking like Silent Hill is not necessarily the same as feeling like Silent Hill but I will elaborate on that in a moment. Sticking with the positives, the game's sound design deserves some praise, mainly because this is the one Silent Hill game that did not feature the god of Silent Hill music and sound, Akira Yamaoka, peace be upon him. Instead, we have Daniel Licht, following up Yamaoka's impossible standard. And I gotta say, he did a pretty solid job. No, his work isn't as good as the music and sound design in the other games, but at no point did I lament Yamaoka's absence while playing Downpour. Licht injects his own brand of industrial noise and moody ambient music, where each track is appropriately matched with each set piece. It's quite clear that he did his homework, that he knew what legacy he was following up, and the fact that he didn't mess it up in any way deserves our recognition and applause. Finally, I gotta hand it to the developers for reviewing the failed attempts at innovation in games like Homecoming and Origins and fixing them in Downpour. Obviously, the major criticism Silent Hill fans level at Homecoming, outside of it messing up the lore, is the clunkiness of the combat. Now clunky can be good, like it was in the first four Silent Hill games, where the restrictive controls amplified feelings of vulnerability. 
In Homecoming, the clunkiness would be better described as unresponsive and unreliable. And to the Homecoming defenders telling me that I just need to get good, I've beaten the Dark Souls games multiple times, okay? I'm telling you, it's the game's fault, not mine. Anyway, Downpour keeps the best elements of Homecoming's combat and combines it with that original restrictiveness. The result is a combat system that is simplified, feels fair, and has just the right amount of positive clunkiness and unpredictability, motivating you to avoid combat unless you absolutely have to defend yourself. On top of that, Downpour adds an element that was introduced through Silent Hill Origins' combat and more or less perfects it. In Origins, you had multiple melee weapons that you could find in your environment, ones that would degrade if you used them too much. Unfortunately for Origins, this great idea wasn't balanced well, because by the end of the game, you could easily end up with 50 melee weapons in your inventory, mostly because you favored avoiding combat or because you used the guns. In Downpour, this problem is fixed by only allowing you to carry one melee weapon at a time. This creates a genuinely fun dynamic where you are constantly scanning your environment to see if you can find a better melee weapon, or at least one that will help you get through the next combat encounter without the weapon breaking. All of these elements are put on display in the game's opening, which set me up to believe that I was in for, at the very least, a decent horror experience. But then something happened in that first hour which poisoned my optimism and that poison would metastasize all the way to the end of the game. What I refer to is the game's first transition into the other world. When I first played this segment of the game, when I went through the constantly expanding hallways and slid down the water slide, the thought that immediately sprang to mind was, this is like being in a Silent Hill theme park, or a Silent Hill themed fun house. Though as I said before, the other world does look cool, and the idea of a theme park type experience with a Silent Hill aesthetic is also very cool, is that what we collectively think of when we hear the name Silent Hill? Is that what made the original game so beloved? What made their horror so unique? Now I'm not averse to the idea of an entire Silent Hill game with this type of horror. I wouldn't recommend it, but maybe it could end up being a good game, even if it wasn't really a Silent Hill game. The problem with Downpour is that it tries to combine this type of overt, surface-level horror with the classic subtle horror from the original games. There are times in Downpour where it captures that classic horror, when you're inside incredibly dark and cramped hallways, stewing in the atmosphere while you're avoiding enemies and solving puzzles. But on numerous occasions, this other style will come in and negate a lot of that tension building. Granted, there are clearly people who are able to appreciate both types of horror simultaneously. And that's awesome! I'm genuinely happy for them! For myself, having both styles present leads to a contradiction. It's stuff like this that, I think, led to the general belief that the Western Silent Hill games were bad, because Western horror sensibilities were clashing with the Eastern. While I believe that is an overbroad generalization, I believe it is at least true in this circumstance. But this isn't the only circumstance where different opposing styles exist simultaneously. Of the many examples, the most prominent has to be the introduction of side quests to the Silent Hill formula. When I was watching other analysis videos of Downpour, the side quests were a constant source of praise, and I can understand why. For a lot of people, the side quests featured small stories and fun puzzles that further immersed them in the town's dreary, despair filled atmosphere. I accept that the content of these side quests enhanced the traditional formula for a lot of people, but for myself, it compromised it in a number of ways. First, even the people who like the side quests will admit that the rewards for doing them are virtually non-existent. Unless you know which ones to do in advance so you can get a slightly better weapon, you're mostly just doing them for the enjoyment of solving a puzzle. 
and maybe getting an extra health pack or a pack of bullets, which you already get enough of if you just follow the main quest line. This is seriously disappointing because one thing that I feel is a part of Silent Hill's core identity is its survival horror gameplay, where you are going from room to room, finding as many resources as you can, and trying to use as few of them as possible so that they can be saved for a boss battle, or something else unexpected. There was always a feeling of anxiety that if you didn't have enough resources, you might not survive. If you were willing to risk checking each potentially horror-filled room, you might fail, but you might also get something very valuable to help you survive, in turn giving you a thorough sense of accomplishment. With Downpour, that scavenging for resources is virtually gone, because all I needed the entire playthrough was a durable melee weapon. I didn't worry about health at any time because there was always a steady supply. And unlike all the other Silent Hill games where my lack of resource management and inexperience caused me to die at least a few times, I didn't die once during my first playthrough of Downpour. Now sure, some of the puzzles in the side quests are of decent quality, but a lot of them aren't. For example, one of them involves you having to dig up a number of collectibles around Silent Hill, but in order to do so, you need to find a shovel. At one point, I tried to do this side quest, but after 10 minutes of looking, I couldn't find a single goddamned shovel. The same thing is true when I was trying to access a ladder to do a side quest. You need to find a unique pulling tool to pull the damned ladder down, which Murphy really shouldn't have to do because he can clearly raise his arm up and pull it down. Instead, he just further proves what Wesley Snipes said to Woody Harrelson back in 92. White men can't. So when you have puzzles with varying quality, little to no reward for completing them, and you have to complete tedious tasks to even access some of them, the side quests, to me, ended up being an exercise in unfulfilled potential and frustration. Roadblocks in a main quest line that actually has a pretty solid pace. Again, I can see why people like the side quests, because they don't mind the parts that I found tedious and they really enjoy the puzzles. But there are so many other ways that the side quests could have been better utilized. My final gripe with the game is small in comparison to the aforementioned changes in tone and pace, but is a huge gripe in regards to the wider franchise. This game has, by far, the worst creature design in any Silent Hill game, period. Every enemy is an uninspired humanoid, indistinguishable from the ones found in B-movies that you'd find in your Walmart's bargain bin. Gone is the varied symbolic design reflective of the protagonist's mental state. Sure, they look creepy and make misophonia-inducing screeches, but almost none of them are designed in a way that begs for more than a second of interpretation. Aside from shattered memories, I had never been disappointed by a single creature's design in a Silent Hill game. But even with shattered memories, I deeply respected the developer's ambition to have the enemies evolve to reflect the player's mental state. With Downpour, my disappointment with the monsters was omnipresent. Now compared to the videos that I have done on Homecoming, Origins, and Shattered Memories, I will admit that I've been far more critical of Downpour so far. But let me be clear. I don't think it's a bad game. I'm being more critical because the game has so many good things going for it. So many parts that I like. I didn't even mention that I believe that the game's story pays off in a pretty satisfying way. At least for me. It returns to the use of restrictive camera angles at times, which were an effective throwback to the classic horror feel. Plus, as somebody who is generally desensitized to horror games, Downpour featured a few effective and well-earned jump scares and disturbing story elements. It's just that for every one of these positive ingredients, there's a negative ingredient bringing it down, which frustrates me so much that I'm inclined to be more vocal with my criticism. 
For every glimpse of classic Silent Hill horror, there's an appeal to Western-style horror. For every classic Silent Hill element that the game includes, like fog, suffocating darkness, and disturbing beams, it forgets basic elements like the monster design and the survival horror gameplay. Every time the game builds up a decent sense of pace with the main story, that pace is ruined if I decide to go do a side quest. Yes, there are people who like the side quests, who like the contrasting styles of horror, who don't care about what should or shouldn't be in a Silent Hill game. And there's nothing wrong with that. But for myself, the result was a game that tried to inject too many ingredients at once in an attempt to appeal to a variety of tastes, without giving those ingredients enough time to bake so they could all work in harmony. Ah, <sighs> that's it! The retrospective series is finally done. Whew. Now I can get back to playing Silent Hill 2 for the 20th time. But before I go and do that, I got a couple of questions. First, would you guys be interested in a video where I focus specifically on what the spirit of Silent Hill is? Where I take all the lessons from the Western games, where they went wrong, and how the franchise could be steered back on track. And of course, what did you guys think of Silent Hill Downpour? I want to hear a variety of opinions from people who both liked and didn't like the game. Leave your thoughts in the comments section below. And please, keep it civil. Make sure to hit the like button if you liked this video, that helps me out a lot. And make sure to subscribe so you can stay tuned for a lot more Silent Hill content coming up soon, amongst a bunch of other in-depth game analysis. Until next time, remember to stay safe and stay yellow.